Amen. You know, I think of, uh, I think of Gary Dozier as a very encouraging man. And he, I got to tell you, he has been a huge encouragement to me to have him uh, as a colleague in our ministry here. And, uh, but boy, today, he was sort of on a roll, wasn't he? Talking about my special Mother's Day sermon, put me under, I'm going to title it Pressure. I mean, I was getting it all week, you know, from the secretaries. I was over at Cannon Beach teaching, and I kept getting these texts, bulletin info needed, Mother's Day. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, yeah, yeah I got to get rid And then he does that to me. And I thought, was he, did I say something to Gary? But then he was so hard on Mike, too. <laughs> did you notice? I don't, I don't know if Gary's in the room. I think he's out in the foyer right now, so I'll... Just tell you what he did. He said, Ed Mir is working. Ed Mir can't be up here. He's on the team. Don't forget to pray for Ed Mir. And Mike, he's not here. <laughs> I had suggested maybe we put a picture of Mike up to remind us to pray for Mike. But anyway, no, seriously. <laughs> uh, Mike is on a family camp trip that they'd planned months ago or weeks ago or whatever. But he's ready to go and eager to lead this team. And uh, I'm totally kidding about Gary. Gary has been integral, obviously, to uh, not only this ministry, but this team. And it's a joy to uh, labor with him until he tells me to, in front of you all, to preach a Mother's Day sermon. I'm not going to. I might someday. <laughs> no, I have. But uh, in this case, mothers, we're going to continue in Luke 10. And I was uh, negligent with the secretaries, and I often am, you know, because they want that title and text and stuff to get into the bulletin. And uh, anyway, it didn't get there because I didn't give it to them. Uh, but I want you to hear the title of the message uh, before we even read the text. We're going to look at an amazing little scene. And I called it undistracted, sitting, and listening. Undistracted, sitting, and listening. And uh, it's fitting, really, that it doesn't always work out this way. I've come, you know, it's our habit, and I believe in this, uh, in your Christian life and in the life of the church, that we should let the Bible rule it's God's Word, and we don't need to go picking subjects in our devotional life. What do I need to work on? And then go self-diagnose. We need to let the Bible just teach us. And so it's not, certainly not wrong to think about it and diagnose from time to time. But today, uh, it's very fitting that we be looking at two women that were big in Jesus' life. And uh, on Mother's Day, it's very fitting that we be looking at two women that Jesus loved Martha and Mary. In fact, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, their brother, the Bible specifically says when they brought him the news, the Bible specifically says, John 11, verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, her brother. So whatever I say today, don't get the idea that, uh, and whatever the text says, because it's written for our instruction. Don't get the idea that Jesus didn't love Martha. He loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, okay? And then, secondly, we're going to talk about distractions and busyness. And uh, we live in a busy day. And I've been thinking about it, I really have, I'm not kidding now, and mothers are busy. And there are plenty of distractions. Meals need to be cooked. Diapers need to be changed. And yeah, we might say, we men might say, there's deadlines down at work, etc. you know. But let me tell you, and let me just start by saying, mothers face relentless 24-7 ministry. And we are so thankful for you. And I want to say to us men, particularly us uh, dads, that we should remember this and do all we can to keep uh, 
times for our wives, for the mothers of our children, uh, separate in the sense that give them, give them some relief so that it isn't a 24-7 relentlessness and step in every now and then and help out. And I think that's one exhortation that will naturally flow from the text even before we get started, but I wanted to say that. And then uh, let me just pick it up and read it. It's a very small uh, paragraph, 38, Luke 10, 38 through 42. Um, and I think of it as basically like a, a three-minute video clip, uh, maybe even less, just a teaching, a little vignette that's set here in Scripture for us. And it's written not merely for Martha and Mary and others, it's written for our instruction. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word, seated at his feet. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone. Tell her to help me. <clears throat> but the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary. Really, only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, let's just let the text speak to us. And uh, we've already asked the Lord. Uh, that's a good thing when you come to the Bible. Lord, open up for me from your word, wonderful things, because this is written, as I said, for our instruction. Notice Martha, verse 38, welcomed him into her home. It's like uh, she's kind of the matriarch, it seems, of this home in a good way. And... Uh, it's a, it's a great thing to welcome the Lord into your home, by the way. I hope he has a prominent place in your home. Uh, it's a great thing to have Christ in your home. She loved Christ. She loved Christ, Martha did, and Christ loved her. You can go read about it in John 11, and there's great testimony, not only of the Lord loving Martha, but of Martha loving the Lord, and we love him. By the way, if you're just getting to know the Lord, or if you're not even sure you know him yet, we love him because he first loved us. It's always that order in the Scripture. We may vaguely think about God, but until we're touched by what he did for us and who he is, we love him because he first loved us us. So Martha welcomed him into her home. And, verse 39, she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word seated at his feet. Now just kind of file that away. She's seating, sitting, she is seated at the feet of Jesus, and notice she is listening, akuo. We've seen this verb all the way through Luke. She's hearing. She's listening. And she's hearing, notice, the Lord's word. I don't know what your Bible says, uh, but... I know some of the translations say he's teaching, and just kind of like she's listening to conversation. She is listening to conversation. But the Bible specifically says she's listening to his 
Logos, his word. So uh, that's the way it is. And if you've been with us in Luke, 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 under the inspiration of the Spirit, wants us to listen to the word, hear the word. And so now he draws this picture, and he doesn't draw it. He just reports it. He just sketches it. Here's what happened. And Martha was inviting him into the home, and Mary was sitting at his feet listening to his words. Now, in contrast, Martha, verse 40, was distracted with all her preparations. Martha is quite a contrast here. Mary is just sitting there absorbing. Mar Martha is distracted by or with or concerning her much, literally, servings, service. Her many preparations, my Bible reads, she was distracted with, and we think of getting the meal and getting the th you know, things ready. And when you have people in, it takes that. And she was doing that, and she was distracted with her much diakonia. And I don't throw those words out just to be throwing them out. I hope that you hear, and, and you know, if you've been with us in Luke, you know that that's ministry, that's service. Deacons are, you know, it comes from that word, diakonos, to serve. And we're all called to serve and, sh and serve us, diakonia. She was distracted by her much service. Mary absorbed with the Lord and his word. Martha absorbed with much service. Um, there are two kinds of people, Martha's and Mary's. And I'm speaking to all of us now, not just women. Uh, there are those of us in this room, I'm sure, who tend to be a little more like Mary and those of us who tend to be a little bit more like Martha. And uh, Martha's who give themselves to service can and often do start to resent Mary's. You know what I mean? And what you've got here, she is distracted. Look at verse 40. Martha was distracted with all her ministry. And uh, she indulged it enough. She stayed distracted long enough. I don't know how long it was, but it's written here for us. She was distracted to the point where she began to question the Lord's care for her. Lord, don't you care? Wow, that's a strong statement. We've seen it before, haven't we? In the storm, the intensity. The guys said during the storm on the boat, Lord, don't you care? Yes, he cares. But we can get to the point in our Christian life where we start to... Maybe you're sitting here today. You're here, but you're thinking, I don't know if the Lord knows my situation. I had the privilege of speaking all week on comfort from the comforter. And we did a lot out of uh, Isaiah 40. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, you know. And the whole 40th chapter just points to who God is. And by the way, it was John the Baptist's marching orders. Uh, he lived it out. You announce to the cities, here is your God, and he did. So everything you learn in Isaiah 40 is about God, and it's about Jesus, because he did announce to the cities of Judah, here is your God. And you have a chapter that I turn to like an anchor for my soul. I don't know about you. I hope you do. But, you know, it closes with the question, what do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel? Where is the Lord? Has he forgotten my situation? We can get there. We can get to where we think, What's, why isn't the Lord doing something? Why? And we get all anxious and distracted, and we can get to the point where we're questioning God. Now, this is not a good statement, I have to say. Lord, do you not care? <laughs> um, 
And then it's just a small step to tell him the Lord what to do. Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help me. Now, in one sense, prayer is like that. We can ask the Lord and tell the Lord. I mean, there's times when, you know, but, but I, can't I can't endorse this statement. I don't think we're supposed to. As we read Martha's uh, statement, tell her, uh, you know, when you get distracted, let me just draw a principle. When you and I are distracted, we are very capable of losing sight of fundamental truth that we really know. The Lord loves me. If you don't know that, you don't know him. If you know Jesus Christ, you know he loves you. He laid his life down for you. God is for you. We know that. But we can get to the point where we're so distracted that we start to question even that. And then, of course, we can, our prayer life deteriorates into telling him what he ought to do instead of him enjoying him and communing with him. And uh, so the Lord answered, verse 41. The Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. By the way, uh, when he says this, it's at least a mild rebuke, isn't it? Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. Really, just a few things necessary. Really, only one. Mary has chosen the good part, and it won't be taken away from her. Martha, Martha. I don't know. Uh, the ones I can think of, uh, it's always an attention getter in the Bible when God says your name. <laughs> Mary, she thought he was the gardener, remember? But when he said Mary, <laughs> and it's good to know he knows your name. But I'm not so sure you want him to say Scott, Scott, <laughs> twice. Saul, Saul, Simon, Simon, Satan's demanded to sift you like... You know what? I won't even go there to say whether it's positive or negative. I just know it arrests your attention when he uses your name twice. And he does. Abraham, Abraham. Don't kill your son. Now I know you trust me above all else. You love me above all else. That was a blessed doubling of the name, huh? Genesis 22, I think it's verse 11. Saul, Saul. In one sense, Paul never got over it. He knows me. The resurrected one whom I was spitting at and had paperwork to kill his followers. I hated him. I met him. Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. That was a blessed day when he heard the name twice. Uh, either way, he does get her attention here. Martha, Martha. She was distracted, notice. She was worried, and she was bothered. I looked them up just because I find it helpful sometimes. This is the only time in the New Testament that the word distracted is used. And this is the only time that uh, the word translated bothered. So both of these are, are just one occurrence. The middle one... Distracted, worried, <laughs> bothered. Worried shows up 19 times. And it's usually translated anxious. And it's what Jesus said, don't be anxious, don't be concerned, don't be worried about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. He took it right to the fundamental issues of life and he said, don't be Worried, anxious. Don't, don't. I'll take care of you. My heavenly Father, he knows when a bird falls to the earth, he'll take care of you. Look at the lilies of the field. They're pretty well clothed. He knows your needs. 
Don't be like those people who don't know him. You know him. Don't worry. And then sometimes it's translated concern. And sometimes in a healthy way. I mean, there are concerns in life, right? Meals do need to be cooked. Diapers do need to be changed. The kids do need to be answered when they're relentlessly talking to you. Sometimes they don't need to be answered, by the way. Honey, I'll talk to you when I'm done talking to the adults. Just stay put. That's good. That, don't worry about that. You won't hurt their little psych. I spent a lot of time at that end of that arm as a youngster because I was a yacker. I didn't mean to say all that, but I just <laughs> got it said. <laughs> but, you know, these things are real. And Paul used the term in Corinthians 7 when he said, you know, I wish you were all just single like me because you married folks have to be concerned about your spouse. And he's certainly not saying you shouldn't be. He's saying you should be. You husbands should be concerned for your wife. You wives should be concerned for your husbands. And I'm speaking to me. I'm speaking to all of us. So there's a sense in which this word can be used in a very real good way. But just the same, uh, in this context, you get the idea. She was distracted. She was worried and anxious and concerned and bothered. Have you ever felt that way? Some of you are saying, have I ever felt that way? Have I ever not felt that way in the last 18 months? Because we get in seasons in life where that's just relentless. And we just are bothered, concerned, worried, distracted. By the way, before I forget, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me your consolations delight my soul that has been an anchor for me and I've quoted it to myself and then requoted it and then quoted it yet again all within five minutes when my anxious thoughts multiply that's what happens with me they multiply. That's Psalm 94. I think it's verse 18 or 19. But they multiply, don't they? They feed on themselves, and pretty soon you're all just bound up. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations, the character of God, who he is, delight my soul. But, uh, you know, he says, Martha, Martha, you, you are so distracted, so worried, so bothered about many things. Only a few things, verse 42, are necessary. When you boil it down, a lot of what we worry about doesn't need to be worried about. A lot of what we, distracts us and gets us bothered in life. There's only a few things. Really, Jesus says what? Only one, which Mary models for us here. Mary has chosen the good part. She has chosen what? She has chosen who? If I had to say it, and I think I should, she has chosen once for all her Savior, her Lord. But now, daily, she's choosing her Lord. Uh, if you want to say what one thing has she chosen, it's not a thing, it's a person. And the most important choice you'll ever make is to put your faith in Jesus Christ and the most important choice of each day as a Christian, as a Christ follower, is to choose Him. Now, these things were not spoken just for Mary and Martha. But notice... There's just a few things necessary, Jesus said, really only one. Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. You choose, and now I'm speaking in the ultimate sense, you choose riches, and they'll be taken away from you. The rich man doesn't take anything more with him than the poor man. 
You choose fame, and the famous man will have his fame taken away from him. You say, is anybody really doing that? Oh, man, read the sports page. Read the business page. Just read people's stories in life. What are they ultimately all about? You choose even good things. Family. And it will be taken away from you. Jesus said that even good things that he created, and by the way, the Christ follower, the one who's devoted to Christ, will find himself, herself, completely enjoying family in a deeper and new way, even when things don't go the way you expect. All these things take on added richness when Christ is in his proper place. But if you put family where Christ belongs, Jesus said, you can't be my follower. If you don't deny, I mean, we've already looked at that chapter, so I won't go back except to remind you that the Bible isn't saying new things all the time. The Bible is pounding away at what's so important in our lives. Mary has chosen the right thing, and it won't be taken away from her. I'll tell you what, you choose pleasure. And we've got a culture of it. <laughs> what do you want to do with your retirement? I want a hot tub, and I want this, and I want that, and we want. You choose pleasure, and it will be taken away from you. <laughs> I guarantee you. But you choose Christ. You say with Paul, to me to live is Christ. It won't be taken away from you. And to die is gain, not loss. And in fact, we've had a whole series. Of just I was telling the people at Cannon Beach, just several in just a short time have passed on into the arms of the Lord, young and old. And uh, they have no regrets in Jesus' arms. Well, let's stop and uh, just draw a couple principles before we close. First of all, Jesus is not teaching here. Jesus is not teaching here. Hard occupation with Christ as opposed to much service. He's not pitting in this story. The Holy Spirit is not saying, much service is really bad. What you want, in contrast to that, is much heart devotion. He's not teaching it as an either-or or a us-and-them kind of a thing. Uh, in fact, as I look at my own experience, the people I know and the people I've had the privilege of knowing who are home with the Lord now, some of them, but many people that I know today, many in this room, who are most occupied with Jesus are most active in service. Paul is jealous in 2 Corinthians 11. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I'm worried that just like Satan deceived the serpent, I mean the serpent deceived Eve, he too will deceive you and pull you away from what? The simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. But what does that chapter go on and say? <laughs> this one who said, I'm all about Christ, and that's what I want for you, Corinthians. He said, I've labored more. I've been in more shipwrecks. I've been, and he listed his missionary adventure, and it was not just sitting around taking it easy. Okay? Um, Paul is the one who said what? For to me to live is Christ. My whole thing, Philippians 1.20, whether by life or by death, my whole thing, my prayer, is that Christ would be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But I guess I'm going to have to stay down here. Why? To take it easy and just continue to get to know Jesus. Is that what it says? Go read that one, Philippians 1. He says, I've got to stay down here to do what? Much ministry. <laughs> I'm needed down here. So don't pit the two against each other. Secondly, Jesus is teaching, Jesus is teaching that the source of the Christian life is the Lord himself. 
We must be occupied with Jesus. We must be undistractedly sitting at his feet, listening. Let me suggest a few things, because Mary is set here before us uh, as an example. Undistracted. I suggest that it's good to prioritize a time and a place in your daily schedule. That's not legalism. That's not just rule-keeping. A time and a place, a space, undistracted. And here I'll really step on a few toes. I don't mean to because I'm stepping on my own, quite frankly. Uh, I would suggest, however, that as we've become more and more plugged in, where we're always just one vibration in the pocket away from dealing with that, you know, we, the electronic age makes it harder and harder for us to be undistracted. And um, I would just suggest that you think about unplugging during that time. I would suggest that if your only Bible reading is on the screen nowadays, I don't know about you, but I can barely cope with the temptation <laughs> that when the sound goes off, I better check the email. Click. And all of a sudden, Romans turns into a to-do list, <laughs> right? And so I would suggest that you at least try. I'm not saying I have both going quite a bit, quite frankly, and I don't want to be a hypocrite here. And I'm finding the benefits of the electronic age are immense. So I'm not here, you know, like a naysayer. But I'm just telling you, you might check it out in your own experience. And you might, if you can't, if you really can't have, or if you haven't for a long time, just got the book. And no phone, no screen, no what does the other translation say? Click. You know, what does the Greek say? Click. What is it? All this stuff. All the tools that are so helpful. But you just get your Bible out and put this phone away and the laptop and just have undistracted time. Notice, sitting. She was seated at his feet. A young missionary was leaving for China back in the old days, and the superintendent of the China Inland Mission, a veteran missionary who was a statesman, he, was, he asked him, what should, I, what, should I, what should be my message for China? And the old guy said, sit at the foot of the cross and tell the people what you see. Boy, I love that. What should I do to help my generation in America or in Africa or in China or in Turkey or in East Europe or wherever? What about down in your office cubicle? Sit at the foot of the cross and tell people what you see. She was seated, did you notice it? At his feet. This speaks of reverence. Remember the guy that was gashing himself in chapter 8 and naked and he was just kind of a picture of the despair and the hopelessness that sin and demonic influence brings in our culture. You don't have to look too far to see it. That guy was just a mess and nobody could restrain him. When he met Jesus Christ, where was he found next? Fully clothed in his right mind and sitting at his feet. That's only appropriate if Jesus is Lord, and he is. Have you been reading? I'm sure you have. The Dalai Lama's in town. In Portland. And it's just amazing to me how the Oregonian and really the culture itself just, just fawn over a mere man. The governor was there. And it's just reported as if everything this guy does, and so they do. He smiled. He chuckled as he walked off the stage, and everyone felt the blessing. And he, as he walked, and I read, 
out under this big picture of him, the headline, a picture of faith incarnate. And I just went, ouch. But anyway, this picture, then the article, and all the detail, and then he bowed before an image of Buddha. That's, don't be deceived, beloved. We're not living in a world very much different from the one Jesus was in and the one Isaiah was in. They take a piece of wood, cut it in half, warm their hands so they don't get cold, and then hire a skillful craftsman to carve this god that won't totter. Be careful. Little children, 1 John 5, 21, guard yourself from idolatry. It is altogether appropriate to sit at the feet, not of the apostle, not of the pope, not of the preacher, not of your favorite preacher, but at the feet of the Jesus Christ who came to die and rise again on our behalf. Sit at his feet. That's where Mary was. That's where the demoniac was. And that's where you and I need to be. And notice, she wasn't just sitting there. Look at it. She was, verse 39, listening. Now, we hear a lot about listening today, and I'm thankful for that. We need to just listen, and we do. We need to hear. But notice, look at verse 39. She was listening not to her inner voice, not to the sounds of silence. She was listening she was meditating, not clearing her mind, this idea that's swept through a couple, three generations now in our culture, saying that meditation is clearing your mind of everything else, just undistracted and just leaving it at that, trying to empty yourself by chanting or whatever. No. Meditation in the Bible, and it's so needed, is listening to the Lord's Word. Filling your mind, not with emptiness, but with substance, the truth of God's Word. How blessed is the man, the first song in the book, Psalm 1. How blessed is the man, woman or child, by the way. How blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. By the way, there's a little walk, stand, sit where you hang out with, then you're more comfortable with, and pretty soon you're just at home sitting. And that's where we should be at home is sitting at Jesus' feet. But what is the delight of that man? How blessed is man who doesn't get all these input from this world, from the ungodly, but his delight is in the Word of God. And in his law he meditates day and night. Mary was listening to the word of Jesus. Oh, I'm all for listening. But don't just listen. Listen to God. Get the Bible open. Read it out loud. Hear it. Every ear gate, eye gate, mouth gate you can use to get it into you. Copy it. It's good stuff to do everything we can to really hear he who is of God, Jesus said, John 8, 47, he who is of God hears the words of God. He who does not, for this reason, he said to these opponents of his, for this reason you do not hear them because you are not of God. You go try to give the word of God to people whose their whole message is just compassion. You give the Word of God to them and they bristle. <laughs> I don't care if they're the 14th reincarnation, supposedly, of compassion. And I'm not here to pick on the Dalai Lama. I'm just telling you, our culture is upside down. And if we're not careful, we'll get upside down. And we'll be listening to all the wrong voices. The one who is compassion, the one who is love, 
the one who is God, visited the planet, and he said, you shall have no other gods before me. And in fact, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father, Philip. Those are amazing statements, and they're either blasphemous or they're to be embraced. He is to be embraced. And I want to sit at his feet and listen to his word. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life, Jesus said. You can't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, Colossians 3.16. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, Jesus said. You can bank on it. He's going to start over. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Invest yourself daily in that which lasts. Feed on his word. Don't get distracted. Don't get uh, worried and bothered. You will be if all you read is the newspaper or if all you read is the trade journal and what you've got to learn to catch up with the deadline that's coming, if all you do is just take care of the kids and just neglect time with the Lord, by and large, watch out over a period of time. We can get to where we're questioning whether the Lord cares for us. Don't you care, Lord? Yes, He cares. He loved Martha, and He loved her brother, and He loved her sister. And Mary was seated in the right place, listening to his word. By the way, listening, meditating, I've said it, but I just want to restate it. What do you listen to? What do you meditate on? The object of your listening and meditating. Spend time at his feet. Carve out time today. How much did you get last week at his feet? Listening. Well, last week was busy, Scott. Okay, let's go back to the week before that. How much, how about, how about the month of April? Are we done with April? I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> we're done with April. How was April for you? You know, I don't say this to produce guilt. I say this to produce a hunger in us. Don't let your life slip away. Just busy doing this and that and the next thing. Spend time with him. And it doesn't preclude much busyness for him, much service. Meals do need to be cooked. Diapers do need to be changed. Students do need to be taught. Deadlines do need to be met. This generation needs to be reached for Christ. And we need the strength that comes from sitting at his feet, listening to his word, so that we can go out and glorify him in our life, whether by life or by death. Father, I thank you.